Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. I'm here today with Travis Lindemon, the Managing Director of Nexus IT Group, an IT recruiting firm that specializes in federal services. So uh, Travis, thank you for taking the time to talk with me. I appreciate it. Why don't you tell everyone a little bit more about your company, Nexus IT Group, and we'll go from there. Yeah, absolutely. Glad to be here. So uh, yeah, Travis Lindemon with Nexus IT Group. We have a IT recruiting firm that specializes in a handful of different practice areas. So a big focus for us is around uh, really the cloud services. So your AWS, Azure, uh, Google Cloud. Uh, We do a ton in the cybersecurity space. And then I would say really the last two that are, are really big for us are digital marketing so your seo kind of paid media uh growth marketers and then lastly uh really the data science side of it so we do a a ton within uh your certain locations uh within new york and canada and san fran around you know data science skill sets data engineers and so those are really kind of round up our uh, core areas that we do from an IT staffing standpoint here in the United States. Which of these has been the fastest growing of them all? Yeah, so I think it's probably a tie between the data science side and also cybersecurity. Uh, those two have been pretty uh, close as far as growth for us. Which is the most profitable? Because you're, you're a recruiting firm, so obviously you make money getting people jobs. So which of those is the most profitable on a per employee basis in terms of recruiting? So I think probably the data science side is is the clear winner there, uh, mainly because how we're paid is a percentage of that person's salary. So uh, the data science, uh, you know, salaries are, are you know, uh, you know fairly competitive um so you know, our, our margins are just better um in, in those skill sets also you know we do a lot in in the san fran uh kind of new york markets for those and so obviously wages are, are higher in those markets uh where cybersecurity, you know we could do stuff in uh, uh your different parts throughout virginia or dc or you know Think about Chicago, Kansas City, where maybe that you know, salary just isn't as high. So definitely data science is a, a more profitable business. So when you're hiring people for these companies, or you're recruiting people for these companies, I assume you're looking at the job descriptions. You have to figure out specifically who uh, has the skills that are needed. What do you see there being a trend in terms of what companies are are looking for within these sectors so let's say within data science within the biggest change if i just think about it holistically and uh, what we've seen from a tech perspective from when i started in 2005 to where we're at now uh in the the early days it was really just somebody that could uh whether it's a developer that could keep their heads down and bang out code um you know or a you know network engineer that could just you know keep the network up and running where we're at now is it really requires both uh the technical skill set but also the soft skills so um you know, our hiring managers want people that can sit in front of the customer or stakeholders and, you know, have those conversations, take those conversations back to the development team and, and develop, right? So everything's so focused on agile and, and, and collaboration that that heads down, you know, kind of leave me alone, don't talk to me type of developer uh, really isn't as in demand or they've had to evolve and grow that, that skill set. So um, I really just think the social kind of soft skills that, you um, you know, may not be natural uh, for some you know individuals in the, the tech side it is really kind of the, the biggest change over the years. What kinds of hard skills are they looking for today? What kinds of projects are these companies trying to work on that they're hiring these people for? Over the last five years, it's really been around transformations. And so uh, what that means is from, you know, on-prem, uh, you know, infrastructure to the cloud and it doesn't always have to be a a cloud provider but those transformations are really uh around uh uh, microservices so i'm trying not to get too technical um but it is basically 
uh, you know, taking a, an old way to, to develop um, technology, and that's whether you're on the software side, um, uh, you know, the infrastructure side of it, uh, that whole, it's what we call DevOps in the industry. So really the DevOps skill set, um, again, whether you're a software engineer, you're a system admin, uh, you know, you're in the cloud space now, um, uh, you're a project manager, companies are really looking for that exposure around, you know, again, containerization, microservices. Okay, so I, I know you're trying to not be too technical, but I want to push on that just a little because sure. a few years ago, I had no idea what you were talking about. If you, if I was okay. listening to this, <laughs> I would have had no idea. But I think it's important even for non-technical founders like myself to get a little bit dirty and understand the technical aspects of their business. So what is a microservice? The simplest way to call it is automation. So um, what microservices does is it takes the old kind of mundane, very uh, labor heavy uh, part of the job and processes, and it automates those tasks. So, you know, there's different technologies, whether it's Chef, Ansible, Jenkins, uh, you know, there's a ton of different providers out there that will uh, assist with that automation. But uh, as an example, so, if you are a uh, you're software engineer, you develop your code. Usually, that code you hand off to uh, what we would call you know a, a you know QA analyst. Um, that person uh, is really responsible for breaking that code right before it ships out to the customer. And so, literally, you know, when it comes to manual QA, you have somebody that is sitting there and pushing buttons, pushing different uh, widgets to make, to see if it breaks. So um, instead of actually having to have that person physically do that, you can automate that task, right? And so um, through microservices, it, it's really throughout the whole software development life cycle that it allows for very quick changes, um, you know, quick development, uh, quick processes. Uh, while also kind of reducing the amount of, of labor that you need uh, from an IT development standpoint. So you mentioned something really interesting that I want to inquire about, which is the manual quality assurance testing. So I, I've done some manual QA for my own product, and we have another person who's a, an automation engineer, although she also was doing a good bit of the manual side as well. You're saying that it's possible to develop a microservice, which would allow you to basically automate away the need for a manual QA. However, I, I'm curious to know how you could do that, and I'll, I'll explain why I'm, I'm asking. What I noticed when I was doing my own testing was sometimes if I clicked on this you know, icon that closes the menu and opens the menu, and then I clicked on this other thing, then I could break something that was you know, new to the, the platform. But if I did it the opposite way, where I clicked on the button and then the menu thing, it didn't break. So is it possible to create the microservice in a way that it actually randomizes the order of pressing things in order to try to break the system? Because if so, then I can see how it's useful in, in removing someone. But only that person, I think, would, would intuitively understand from historical button pressing oh, this thing breaks in this order, but not in this order. All testing starts off on a manual basis. Um, so you're not, a, you're not eliminating that manual uh, you know, QA skill set per se, but as you're mentioning, once that happens and the manual side uh, goes through it, then that is when the automation can come into play. So whether you're using tools like Selenium WebDriver, um, you know, Test in G, there's a number of different you know, automation tools out there that you could use. I'm glad you said that because I, I was taught that you should manually test things and then try to create automations for them. Uh, we never got to a point, we haven't gotten to a point yet where we can automate things just because we have so many, so so much of the platform that hasn't been uncovered yet because uh, we coded so much of it. Um, so I'm, I'm glad you have this experience. I'd like to kind of talk about it a little bit more because I don't think I have an episode where we talk about really testing. 
Um, I'm not sure how excited you are about the subject. <laughs> it's again, it's it's a uh, it's something I've spent a good amount of time doing. Uh, I, I would say that you know there's. Uh, people in my firm right that focuses on this on a daily basis but definitely have done uh my good share of uh qa testing let's say you're talking to a non-technical founder who needs to hire you know someone for qa who would be the first person from a qa team that you would want them to hire there's so many different titles, but generally what you would think of as like a qa architect um but I would say with QA, a lot of times they're not titled architects. So you're really looking for that senior QA professional. And the biggest thing, you know, that that you're looking for is, you know, have they set up um, and created, I guess, their own, you know, test automation framework. These individuals that have the automation skills would have started generally their career on the manual side and been you know, forced to do manual testing. So they have that. Uh, but what happens is a lot of you know, automation um, professionals have not set up test automation frameworks from scratch. And, and that is key. Um, if you're you know, diving into that, you want somebody that has had that experience or has the ability to do that. Um, because what happens is so many of these individuals have great QA automation skills, but the frameworks were already set up, you know, once they joined the firm or, you know, in a new company, and they actually have not had to set up, you know, that, that framework. So in our situation, we had hired someone to build, to build it for us. And she was using Excel. And it was ridiculous. I mean, impossible and massive waste of time. So we, we tried to force her to use Jira and X-Ray. I don't know if you're familiar with X-Ray. Mm -hmm. yep. yep. So we, we wanted to set it up on Jira with X-Ray and she was like, yeah, no problem. But she continued to build it out on her Excel anyways and basically ignore us. So after a few months, we just got mad at her and fired her for just ignoring what we asked for. Then we hired another guy and he started building it on X-Ray and, and we started to move so much faster. But we also found that there, there were a lot of gaps in the um, feature documentation so that the testing side was lacking information and causing tests to fail because the, the images were wrong based on like what our Figma said it should be versus what the, the documentations are so many problems. And it, it took us a very long time to sort it all out, but it required our product manager. Well, it required hiring a product manager and a new QA manager to work together along with me to make sure that everything was right. And um, yeah, just an absolute, absolute mess. What's the, what's the worst situation you ever kind of walked into? And you're like, oh my God, how am I supposed to fix this? I don't know if it's, something we walked into i think it's something that happened as uh, part of a, a project that we were on um so we were working with and i, I can't use names unfortunately but uh um they were working with a, a very high profile um uh, managed services provider, so they provide consulting services to to massive you know fortune sized companies and so um <clears throat> We had a, a couple employees out on on staff um, supporting a very large migration project um, from uh, an old email system to a new you know a new email system, and and part of their you know job is to automate you know that that task. Um, unfortunately, uh, one of the QA individuals had deleted over 200,000 email boxes for this client um, as they were getting ready to go live less than like a week out. So um, that's not something we walked into. Unfortunately, you know, it was we were part of the project um, along with other, you know, IT professionals. So that was a, a fun uh, several days <laughs> in, in trying to get through that and, and bring in new talent to, to help fix, you know, the issues. So they had a backup or, or no? 
in this situation, it wasn't a backup scenario, a um, little bit older technology, so things weren't quite in the, the you know, cloud yet. Um, there was uh, you know, some backup from you know, an old you know, tape perspective, right? Um, but it was more of all the work was kind of already pretty much completed and they were trying to, to test it you know, from a beta perspective. Um, so it wasn't like, oh my gosh, they're all gone, but it was, um, I mean, it was an oh my gosh moment because there was a ton of work that just kind of went bye bye, and um, you know the the go live date was quickly approaching. So uh, that was really for us and from our perspective, that was and for the client was just a huge nightmare dealing with that. So um, we've walked on, you know, on to and take on taking on new you know, new projects where, and it's kind of what you described where you know, what they were hoping for, what they wanted from a QA perspective, it just, it, you know, it wasn't syncing up. So basically have to, to start from scratch and, um, you know, make sure that, uh, again, as you're setting up the, the automation that it, it is fulfilling, you know, what the stakeholders want, right? So um, there's a lot of those types of projects where, you know, it's just kind of, it's not working or, you know, somebody maybe went like, a little bit of a cheaper route. So use somebody just um, that was referred to them that maybe doesn't have as much experience or they use you know, different like in um, uh, you know, Upwork or you just kind of outsource it you know, overseas. And so sometimes uh, you know, those projects can be um, just a little messy and we've had to come in and, and help with those. So when your team member caused the email inboxes to disappear how did you handle that with the client to like save the whole thing from falling apart i mean the first thing is right you want to like understand and do a discovery like how did this happen but unfortunately there wasn't like a ton of time to like point fingers um you know because obviously when we spoke to our employee he said that you know somebody from the other team you know um had told him to push this push it out basically. Um, so, you know, again, you don't want to do a lot of the finger pointing. So for us, it was really like, okay, how, you know, what needs to happen for us to get this back online as quickly as possible, right? And so uh, really that meant just staffing up, um, you know, not only more people, but even at a higher level, you know, from a knowledge standpoint, so that they can get in and, and quickly, you know, diagnose and, and hopefully, you know, resolve the, the issue. So um, obviously they're screaming, upset, maybe a few not nice words, but you just have to be, you know, unfortunately things happen in, in life, right? And, and it's not, it wasn't malicious. Um, so it's just, you're trying to understand like where they're coming from, right? They're on a deadline, all this work is done. Um, you know, obviously a huge nightmare for the client, but just how can we stay calm, work through this? What do we really need to do to, to, to get this back working um, is really kind of the approach that we took. So, so yeah, so we had about 24 hours to find about eight highly sought after, you know, QA professionals to come in and and help on a you know short term kind of you know basis. So so it was a costly mistake. Did it make you go over the time period that you had? Like did did it took longer to fix? Yeah. So we did. They they did have to um, get an extension from the client. Obviously, we had to have you know conversations on what happened. Uh, you know try to communicate on how it happened and, and, you know, obviously both parties kind of, you know, took blame in it because, uh, you know, they're the consulting partner that have the direct relationship with the client. And, and obviously our client is the, the middle person there. Um, but it was about a couple weeks um, late, uh, unfortunately. So um, they were understanding of it. I mean, they still had their, you know, existing, you know, providers and stuff. So it wasn't like, oh my gosh, our you know, staff, you know, just don't have any emails. It's, it, um, uh, it was, yeah. So, well, I should say they didn't have any emails for a little bit there because what happened, uh, but that from a backup standpoint, we, that was able to get, you know, back online. I think it was 24 hours, but all the work to getting the migration done was a, about a two week delay. So. 
who took the biggest financial hit from that? Because obviously you had to bring on more people, so that was going to cost more. Yeah, I would say our firm. Um, so obviously uh, that was a, not a profitable um, engagement. Uh, so yeah, so you know, and, and at that point you get into do we have to start looking at you know, you know from an insurance standpoint, right? Because we all you know generally IT firms will carry you know E and O, your know, technology E and O, um, you know insurances, and so like do we you know, spend that time you know going down that route, or do we just eat you know kind of the the cost to to get this fixed so um yeah 100 percent. like we we were impacted the most financially so what do you think is the biggest thing you learned from that besides thinking about insurance and and these kinds of things yeah i think it's really just um the the biggest kind of processes i guess that we've put in place you know since some you know an engagement like that is um really better uh, a communication but also documentation around if there's a big event like that that's happening and, and one of our employees is tasked to to do it um, we do get at least one to two levels up written approval that this is what you know is supposed to happen so that way you know, when they say, okay, yeah, we sign off on this, that it's ready to go and we hit the go button and it doesn't work, that we're not the only ones, you know, that are accountable for that. It's okay. So, you know, two members from your, your upper level management team have also reviewed this and looked at it and it says it's good to go. Um, and, and so that's a, the biggest thing that we put in place is just better documentation. And not only just documentation, but from the, you know, the, the individuals that would be, you know, giving our, you know, team of, of professionals, um, you know, guidance on, on what to do. So has this helped you to anticipate problems in, in general? And it for sure, uh, creates a little bit more level of cautiousness. So when we go on to engagements, as an example, uh, you know, really understanding the lay of the land like why are you know why are we needed um you know where has the you know project failed um you know uh it, it, so there's, there's just a series of things there because usually when we're called in to help out um it, it's a couple things right it's their um they're behind schedule uh maybe they don't have the, you know the internal skill sets or you know uh yeah skill sets right word there to to fulfill the project right so they don't have the the right um uh, technical skills to to get it done um or there's been somebody else on the project and it's not working out um and so when it's that ladder it's really trying to understand uh, where did they go wrong? Where were expectations not met? Are they over budget? You know, where are they out on the schedule? Uh, just, you know, all those things that we can look at and diagnose and say, hey, we're confident this is something we can come in and help on. Or are we just going to be like the you know prior firm where the expectations, uh, you know, are, are too high from a client perspective? And so we're going to be set up for failure either way. Yeah, I've, I've discovered talking to different companies that usually when problems happen on a project, it's usually because the founder or the person who is responsible for handing over the information doesn't have all the information to hand over and more information comes along as the project is going and it changes the, the specifications of the project. And I am a hundred million percent at fault for doing this internally with my own team. Um, where they'd be, I'd be like, oh, this is the feature. And then in the middle of like sprint planning, like, oh, actually I forgot there's this other little thing that needs to be a part of it too. And they're like, but that adds to the complexity by like another two points. That means we can't do it this time. We have to push it back another week. You're messing with our schedule. So I, I, I definitely uh, pissed my team off quite a bit. So eventually we had to hire someone to take me out of that role so that she would be the one that planned it all. And, and we had a lot of a smoother ride from that, from then on. Well, and I think it's also good to point out just in today's like changing landscape, uh, and the way that people want to work and the choices that they have is that we'll also it's so it's not only you know, what you, I described and what you described, but it's also like, uh, you know, 
is there a certain person on the team, whether it's, you know, leadership or, uh, you know, maybe just a individual contributor that is very challenging to work with? And are they running people off the project? Because that, you know, is very, a very real problem that we have, you know, in, in at least, you know, the IT space uh, where, you know, people have choices. And so if, if that manager is very challenging to work with or uh, just, you know, uh, people will just leave <laughs> so um you you have to look at like what is the the turnover of the the project um and, and get a feel for that too because uh you know unemployment is, is obviously at a low uh, really you know across the nation but um you know from an it standpoint we're basically at a uh you know zero percent unemployment rate essentially so um so yeah it's that's a whole new you know dynamic uh you know the amount of ghosting that we've had with candidates that accept offers and don't show up uh is just unreal uh you know really i would say since probably about 20 2019 or so um it's really has become a, a real problem so yeah so you're not only evaluating like is, is it a good project financially but um you know are there challenges within our customers teams that you know we're not able to solve those you know if you have a, a you know a, a cancer on your team like um there's nothing that we can do about that because our people are just gonna leave if uh you know you have that situation have you ever gone to a client and be like look we want to work with you but you've just got this person on your team that's making it impossible yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's uh, we have a client right now that's been a, a really good client for us for several years, and they have um, an individual that it's it's a it's not necessarily a subsidiary, but it's a different side of the business that we really haven't worked with too much, and we haven't even uh, had people st start, but just from an interview perspective, we've gotten to the final interview and they say, I love the company. I love what they're doing. I'd love the role, but I cannot work for that manager. And I think that's probably about 12, 12 or so people that have you know, provided that feedback this year from that manager. And so that is kind of that tough conversation that we have to go to, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, a, a, you know your top HR professional or, um, you know, a CTO or CIO and, and have that conversation because you're not want, you don't want to get that person in trouble, but it is good feedback, you know, for them to have. And so it, it's been interesting. They, they still let him interview, but he's not allowed to really ask questions or respond. So he's more there visually um, and it, it hasn't really helped. So we're still kind of working through, um, you know, the person's been like a, a long-term employee too. So I think there's just some challenges, you know, with that, but yes, uh, that's a, uh, an example that, you know, we're dealing with at the moment on how do we continue to coach this client that they're losing talent because of this one person. Um, and it must be pretty bad if the people, that many people are giving that feedback just from like two interviews with this, this individual. So. Yeah. I always try to give someone the benefit of the doubt and, and make an assumption that they may not be aware that they're doing what they're doing. So there, there's, character flaws and there's ignorance. And so I, I like to side on, on, I like to side with ignorance until someone proves to me that it's a character flaw and, uh, who knows how the company's handling it. Maybe they didn't even have the heart to explain to him that people were upset and maybe just like, Oh, let's, let's try something different. So, you know, they may be handicapping him by not allowing him to learn why people aren't happy with him as a manager. And so he can't progress in his career and they're holding him back by coddling him. So yeah, I, that sucks. I, I hate that, you know, that's the situation. You've been running this company for over 10 years, right? Yep. So, uh, just over 12 years now. Okay. Yep. What's the hardest decision you've had to make in running this company? Hmm. I th think the biggest challenge um, is really 
so when I look at our internal kind of sales and recruiting team uh, from that perspective, the, the biggest thing is you you hire people, you know, generally within the first month that they're not going to work out. But I have like a soft spot for people. And so I, I hope that they change. I hope it's going to get better. So the big and I know it may be cliche, but I guess the, the biggest part for me is just like you know, hire quickly, fire quickly. I just am not good at that. So, cause I just, I want to hold on that. Like, I know they can get better. You know, can I change them? Um, can I get them to work the way I, I want them to work? And so, uh, you know, I would say, you know, 12 years uh, you know, plus into this, I still struggle with that. You can tell within, I mean, maybe even a couple of weeks if they're going to be long-term employees, and yet you let them stay for six months or 12 months or, you know, whatever the case may be. So that, that's exactly what I was talking about just now with like some people, it's a personality flaw and some people it's just ignorance. They need time to learn. And um, I've made plenty of those mistakes where I, I was sold. I thought that they were going to be a good employee and then they proved me wrong, but I took a little bit longer than I should have to fire them. And then it took forever to fix the problems that I enabled them to create. And uh, so, yeah, I've been learning how to be tougher on people <laughs> because I just can't. Yeah. And I think it's kind of the, also like your ego, like you, you know, if you made the decision to hire that person, you don't want to be wrong and that they, they're not a good fit. I, it's probably a number of different things. It's being, you know, soft hearted, right. And, and maybe a little bit ego driven too, where it's like, I know, I know there's something good in there. We just got to find it. But, you know, generally it ends up whether, you know, we either have to let them go down the road or, or they leave because it's not a good fit. So I have no problem admitting I'm wrong. I think it's just I wanted to give them a chance to adapt to our system, but then, you know, some people just can't. And, and when you start to see them like actually breaking processes is when there's the flags co come up and you're like, okay, no, we can't tolerate that anymore. Um, my, my COO had, uh, he had like a flag system. He's like, you know, th this is a yellow flag. This is a red flag. You get two, two, three, you know, three red flags and we have to fire you. Something like that. Like a red card, like with, with let's fuck with the football. Right. It's like some things are like, it, I don't like it. It's not a fireable offense. You know, we need to give them the opportunity to learn from this. If they don't learn from this, it's a red flag. Or if something they do is like, for example, uh, the person who on your team enabled or or was part of the problem that allowed the email inboxes to get deleted. During the investigation phase, we would discover, is this a yellow flag or a red flag? If it's a red flag, you got to go right now. Sorry. If it's a yellow flag, okay, well, you know, how do we make sure you don't do that again? Because otherwise you're fine, but if you have a history of these things, then clearly we can't um, enable that. So if that's something you struggled with changing, what's something that you have successfully changed about yourself in the last 12 years that you know you feel has made you a better business owner? Definitely. I used to be a hothead uh, at work. And so it just because it, I, you know, it, it's so personal to me, right? So it, I started the company on my own. Um, you know, we've grown it to be a, you know, a multi-million dollar agency. And so I want people, I wanted people to work the way I wanted them to work. I wanted them to like care as much as I did. I wanted them to work as hard as I did. Um, and so, you know, I think just with the generational changes and how people want to work as changes and uh, just that whole, um, I don't want to get too much into the, what's in the mainstream, uh, uh, articles right now online but uh but yeah i just uh, over the years have had to kind of like take a step back remind myself you know nobody's going to care as much as you do and why should they um you know and, and really put people in place that can really uh you know 
kind of soften that blow or kind of be a arbitrator between me and, and other, uh, you know, staff as well, which has helped quite a bit is, you know, not being so emotionally connected to, to you know, their success of the organization. So I am still a hothead, unfortunately, and I've had to learn that I could very easily get angry and then I would show that anger to the team, which would obviously make the team angry because they're like, whoa, what the hell's going on? Like, where did this come from? Because it, it, it's like when you scream at a baby, no, you know, don't do that thing. Or like the baby's like, whoa, like they don't they they don't have the ability to process like why you're angry because they don't understand. It's the same with dogs, cats, whatever you, you yell at something and they're like, ah, what do I do? Um, and so by working with my COO, he was, he helped me to realize after this happened several times, like, I can't keep doing this because it lowers morale. It makes me look like a bad leader. And instead, uh, to allow the anger to subside and come back the next day, curious with tons of questions. And when you come with questions, instead of anger, you actually enable a conversation to happen rather than accusations and and fear and anxiety and stress and crying and, and all the stuff that you don't want people to feel. And so it was during this process that I felt like I was becoming a better leader because I don't know what's happening all day long. I shouldn't know what's happening all day long. It's not my responsibility to do that. It's my COO's responsibility to keep up with everything. And so if I see something in a Slack channel that angers me because like, oh, what the hell? Why, you know, why are they doing this? It feels like they're going around some work that I was trying to do, but like actually, according to my COO, I'm not supposed to be doing that work, right? They're supposed to be doing that work and I should have just passed off the information, but I was trying to get in the middle of it and, and they were having a conversation without me about it. And it was like, so oftentimes problems are because of uh, lack of understanding of expectations and uh, h- not hierarchy, but responsibility between different people. And so sometimes I would get mad because I'd felt like I was being cut out of something where in reality, I shouldn't have been a part of it to begin with. Mm-hmm. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think that that's that's definitely something that, uh, you know, get over the years, just uh, you know, impacts, you know, your mental health, your stress levels, you know, your, you know, relationships at, at outside of work, whether it's your family, your spouse, kids, uh, whatever, um, that you really have to be able to, to take a step back. Um, like you said, I, um, I don't necessarily use the 24 hour rule. That, that is a good one. My, my kids coaches, uh, soccer for the soccer team that use that. You can't, talk to the coach for after until after 24 hours to let things uh uh cool off a little bit um but uh but yeah it's just that that's been the biggest kind of growth area i think is um and it, it's 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 good for everybody whether it's you know employees you know business partners uh you know family whoever else may be involved so how do you handle distractions? I don't. Um, I I'm a distracted person, <laughs> so uh, still working on that. That is a flaw that I think most of my teammates would say <laughs> I have. Well, it's good to be honest with yourself. Then I know I'm I'm addicted to coffee and sugar, and I keep trying to get off of them, but they enable each other. It's like people who they'll only smoke when they drink right it's like i usually only have a pastry if i'm having a coffee because in europe that's just what people do you go to the cafe you get a coffee and a pastry you sit at the table you have a chat you sit there for an hour and but if i don't drink the coffee i won't have the pastry so i I get it yeah distractions are, are hard in that regard um is there anything we haven't talked about that you wanted to kind of mention covered a, I mean a good amount there's there's so much stuff out there I mean you could talk about you know the uh, you know just how the landscape has changed even in the last year um, as it relates to hiring you know we've seen slowdowns in the the tech space and how people are you know handling that obviously coming off of like call it q3 ish q4 um, 2020 you know the I think the whole market was kind of booming right and and you know 
kind of the the slowdown that we we've seen here more recent but then there's still like a ton of jobs out there and not enough people for them uh you know and, and just uh, you know continued uh, uh issues with candidates that are, are ghosting and then there's a whole movement of quietly quitting and all that so there's a ton of stuff that uh you know that we deal with on a, a daily basis whether it's coaching clients um or just our our own candidates as as well and how can people follow up with you and your firm yeah so um we have a very interactive website so nexusitgroup.com there's different ways to talk to us whether you're a candidate or if you're a hiring manager looking to you know staff up for your team um you can also find me you know on linkedin um i'm on there every day so uh just travis lindemone um via the next actually there's only one of me so yeah just type in Travis Lindemann on LinkedIn and you'll find me so all right great so thank you very much again for your time and your energy I appreciate it and don't forget that entrepreneurship is a marathon not a sprint so take care of yourself every day and don't forget that when you need to hire people sometimes you need to plan for it and make sure you have an additional budget because the the world is changing and uh Inflation is wrecking everyone's ability to live, and so we have to be ready to sp spend more to get uh, good talent to stay for longer periods of time on our projects. Thank you, Travis. Appreciate it. Thank you.